Thank you very much. Uh, I'm again going to thank Far de France, really, for the organization, in, in particular uh, uh, Jacques Monchard, with the support of SMIDEST, which are really two extraordinary days that we're spending here for the uh, Lighthouses and Beacons Network and for all those who love lighthouses. The seminar is coming to an end now. This fourth session is going to tell us about new prospects, new perspectives, and uh, after the, the explanations we had this morning on some of the fundamental aspects, this afternoon we're coming back to m more practical uses of uh, Fresnel lenses in very different areas, in totally new dimensions, in particular in uh, aesthetics and uh, the beauty, in fact, of the lens. So our three speakers uh, will each talk to us about uh, applications of Fresnel lenses in very different areas. So, it's, in fact, it's uh, the, the border or the crossroads between science, art, and culture. So I'll call Mr. Kerler first and foremost. Uh, he is going to be, he's the equivalent almost of the, well, he's the president, he's the equivalent, he's the president of the German Lighthouse Organization. Uh, and uh, the Lighthouse authorities in Germany. And today he is the chairman of an NGO. And uh, the purpose is to create a cultural route, a European route of lighthouses. And they are applying for a, a European uh, label, which uh, will be the cultural routes of the Council of Europe. And uh, he has started, uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit what they've been doing in the last three years to, to try to work on that European route of lighthouses project. So, Mr. Kohler, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, I have now the most challenging part of the presentations to wake you up after the lunchtime. And I hope uh, I can uh, reach the target. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about a uh, project which was set up between different countries, uh, which we are calling the European Root of Lighthouse Project. Uh, what are the results? What have we already reached? And what are the challenges we are facing at the moment? First of all, I would like to explain you a little bit uh, about the background of the project, then what we did and what we are doing at the moment, organizational issues uh, with this, such a um, uh, non-profit organization between different countries, uh, it is uh, also a challenge. And at the end of the day, uh, these conclusions uh, which we have found together. The Cultural Roots of the Council of Europe is a uh, project um, which was uh, inaugurated in 1987. And uh, this has illustrated uh, that many different countries are working together on cultural issues. At the moment, there are more than 40, I think 47, different cultural routes existing through the whole European country, account, uh, European uh, region, uh, from all countries, not only EU countries, but also associated countries uh, like, for instance, Norway. And the idea was to set up a new cultural route. Maybe you are wondering, but up to now, there is no route related to the lighthouses existing through Europe. It is the first time that uh, this approach is made. And uh, up to now, uh, we have a lot of routes like uh, uh, the uh, bricks and uh, cemeteries and whatever you can imagine, but nothing about lighthouses. We would like to up, set up a, a cross-national cooperation uh, among lighthouses and their countries and regions. Um, and uh, we would like to define also activities which are uh, similar or which are common that also the lighthouses and the visitors better understand each other and you get uh, 
a broader audience uh, for these activities than before. And last but not least, uh, we would like to establish an org organizational umbrella for such activities. And um, last, the, the, the final target is to become a cultural root of Europe, of the Council of Europe. Uh, that is a, a long process, and we cannot expect from the beginning that we will be such a cultural route. We will not interfere with the local activities of the different countries and the different lighthouses, but we would like to support them uh, by some kind of framework and um, to uh, preserve them, but also to set up new activities uh, among the lighthouses and countries. The base for all of them, all of these activities, um, is uh, the um, uh, regulations uh, which have been uh, issued by the European Parliament and uh, certified by the Council of Europe. We have to present the European values, and that must be at least three countries, which are working together to build up such a route. We have also to do scientific research. We have to support the memory, the history, and the heritage uh, within Europe uh, up, to the, uh, up to the present days. Cultural and um, educational exchanges for young people is also one important issue. The <clears throat> projects for tourism and sustainable cultural development are also considered uh, when you are, uh, would like to become a cultural route of Europe. And last but not least, uh, we have to address different groups of tourists and persons uh, which should be interested in these lighthouses. If you are looking into the past, then it was an, let's say, older generation which were facing to these things. But we would like to address also the younger generations, like Dave uh, has shown yesterday. To set up an organization like that is a challenge because we are not a governmental organization. Um, and uh, we have had within the last uh, years and last months uh, a lot of discussions among, among the founding members uh, how we would like to set up this European route of lighthouse. First of all, we had to define who can be a member in this organization. And this is rather simple. A member can be somebody or an organization which owns, borrow, manage a lighthouse, not uh, as a navigational aid for other purposes. It can be a navigational aid together with the other purposes, but also lighthouses we not, which are not in operation anymore for, for navigational aids could be become a member. Then how to manage this uh, with all the different opinions. Each member has one vote. Independent, if it's like Fort de France, which is one of the founding members, has more than 45 lighthouses, or we in Germany, which are at the moment have 10 lighthouses uh, behind us. It's uh, one vote for everybody. But the, also the number of lighthouses under the umbrella or together with the member are considered to decide then um, for, uh, to decide. We need a qualified majority of 55% of the members that representing 65% of the lighthouses which under this umbrella. There we were looking a little bit uh, to the European Union, how, do, how they make their uh, decisions. And uh, uh, that was uh, at the end of the day, the outcome of our internal discussion. We are not only looking to uh, umbrella organizations like the Great Lights of Ireland or uh, Father France, also individual lighthouses could be members of this organization. This organization has uh, an executive board. Uh, in the executive board, uh, we have a uh, first chairman, second chairman, and a treasurer. And uh, we can also adopt um, uh, additional members up to five. And we can also set up working groups for certain issues. And the um, 
highest gremium uh, is the uh, Congress of the General Assembly, which uh, will take place once a year. The foundation took place September this year in Brussels. And uh, you can see here two of the founding countries, which are also represented uh, on this picture. Dave Ward from Ireland and also Fort de France, here represented by Jean-Marie Cabé and uh, Philippe Ledin. Uh, they are uh, one, uh, one of the members. Uh, this, uh, you, yeah, you, uh, Jean-Marie is just showing the original document. That is the uh, founding document signed by all founding members. Who are the founding members? From Estonia, the development center of Hiuma, uh, which is re representing at the moment, I think, five uh, different lighthouses on the islands of Hiuma and Sarema. A Fort de France with this group of uh, uh, lighthouses under this umbrella. In Germany, we are representing uh, 10 lighthouses we have more which are open for the public, but to reach them is also a challenge. Ireland, uh, the commissioners of Irish Light uh, with the Great, Eyes of, Great Lights of Ireland organization. Norway, uh, the Lindesnes Lighthouse Museum. It is more than one museum. It is a group of um, museums along the coastline. And uh, the uh, head of this museum is also... <coughs> The head of the museum is also our chairman. In Portugal, uh, there is the um, Maritime Authority, which is uh, responsible for all the lighthouses, part of our organization. I would like to summarize what is the main target, what we are doing, the exchange of information, knowledge, and experience on a structured way. When we have set up uh, the... Uh, organization, uh, we have never seen each other because the, before we, we signed the um, foundation document, we have never seen each other personally. Everything was done via internet, video conference, email exchange. And uh, when we have met each other, then we have seen we have all the same problems. <laughs> we have all to solve the same problems. And also uh, the communication among each other uh, was running from the beginning very, very well. Jean-Marie or Dave can say something against this, uh, but I hope they will agree. <laughs> if uh, somebody uh, is interested to become a member, uh, we can provide a so-called starter package. There we explain what we are doing, what uh, documents are needed, uh, also what we would like to support, and uh, an application form. Um, According to our statutes, uh, the decision of membership is made by the executive board. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, the, the lighthouse you have seen, uh, that is uh, in Germany, the lighthouse where I'm also a personal member in, uh, it is in Warnemünde, uh, if somebody is interested uh, to come to the Baltic Sea, uh, then uh, you are more than welcome. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Köhler. Je... Thank you very much, Mr. Köhler. I've duly noted the invitation to come to Warnemünde on the Baltic Sea, and uh, thank you so much for presenting this wonderful project to us. And I'll now very soon leave the floor to Mr. Peter von Baumus, uh, who is an illustration of European scientific cooperation because he first graduated from the Zurich uh, Polytechnic School, then from uh, the school, technical school in Munich, and now he is teaching at the University of Toulouse. He's a professor. And uh, he is tasked with the Gamma Lens project at CNES, uh, and he's going to talk to us about Fresnel today. Uh, I don't know if there isn't a form of serendipity uh, and in a framework that we thought would not be possible, so we're really eager to hear from him.
Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Merci. Euh... So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here this afternoon after lunch. And thank you to the organizers and to the ex for all the excellent presentations we've seen over those two days. It's been magnificent. I am going to present a very different aspect of Fresnel lenses because you have now seen them being used as collimators. I prepared that in English. So you have seen it, as a matter of fact, as collimators. And uh, of course, uh, this is what makes these uh, things bright here because the beam is concentrated. But then could you use it also, for example, in astronomy as a concentrator, not as a collimator, but as a concentrator. And uh, as you will see, astronomy is not really a big, uh, a big market for Fresnel lenses. Uh, probably in the future for space applications, uh, one of the reasons is that lenses at all have essentially been stopped using in, uh, in professional astronomy. Uh, whereas uh, light towers, the upper row here, have moved to lenses, uh, refraction essentially, in 1823 or so. So astronomy has moved to mirrors, has exactly made the opposite move, with Newton in 1668 already. Uh, so you have uh, Galileo's telescope here, early 1600s, uh, invention, a Dutch invention, and uh, you see... Probably one of the reasons I could talk about, that it's not the issue here, say why we moved to mirrors. Well, one reason is you can make them real big. Uh, there is lots of other reasons I might talk about it, but my talk is here about how we could use them in astronomy. And as you will see, it's mostly high energy astronomy. Actually, this is my domain. I'll show four examples. One is, uh, as a matter of in the visible domain, a Fresnel interferometric imager, then uh, two ways. We use the principle of Fresnel in high-energy X-ray astronomy, and then also high-energy cosmic rays. This is actually astroparticles. This is high-energy uh, nuclei impinging on our detectors, mostly above the atmosphere or within the atmosphere. So sounds quite esoteric, but let's see in the end it looks a little bit like the Fresnel lenses you've seen. The first principle is from a colleague of mine, Laurent Coquelin, who has uh, developed Fresnel zone plates uh, for astronomy. Uh, they have a particular shape here. Uh, you can achieve high angle resolution, high dynamic range, and a huge spectral span. You can go from the UV over the visible to the infrared range. There is no lenses, no mirrors involved, and, uh, well, one of the downsides, it's not very efficient because you absorb already 50% of the light just by this black and white pattern, this diffraction pattern. And then, well, uh, the outermost row here, which can be only made so thin, uh, limits here the focal length, or at least uh, it makes it extremely long. So um, an artist's vision here of Laurent is two formation flying spacecraft. We have seen something similar this morning in Alain Aspets here, particular exoplanet coronagraph. This is something a little bit similar. Here it's 2.5 to 18 kilometers for the visible range and uh, has been a CNES project. Uh, right now, this is on hold. But Laurent has tested that here in Nice on the huge refractor at the Nice Observatory. This is an 18 meter uh, focal length lens actually. And he made his uh, Fresnel zone plate sitting here on the outside. And on the back side, you have a detector and you see a couple of images to show what you can do with that. So you have Jupiter here and you see Sirius B, which is actually a double star system. Now, okay, this is as far as we did, at least here in the French environment, for Fresnel lenses in the optical, in the visible range. Now, there is not only the visible range. You have, of course, these celestial lighthouses, which we observe with other means. 
Now, this is only one slice of the sausage. If you shrink that down here, this makes the whole sky visible over you. And this is actually, well, the visible slice. And there is much other. There is just different wavelengths, which you can't see. It's above you. It goes from radio over microwaves, infrared, over ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. You have heard all these things from your doctor who uses some of these wavelengths to analyze you. We in astronomy use all these different wavelengths. And here you have just a very summary of all these different uh, skies, which are all over you. You just can't see it. But well, we can see them with different telescopes. And uh, we are now concentrating on the, the right side here, X-rays, gamma rays, and how we are doing right now images of the sky is with a technique called coded mask. So it's shadow casting. So you produce a first layer of material which is relatively opaque, tungsten, three centimeters, so to really stop the gamma rays. And so light goes through at some places and not at other. We use that on an imager called integral, and uh, we have been involved in the spectrometer on integral which uses a huge, thick coated mask, which is hexagonal, which you see here with, by the side. And with that strange telescope, we have produced here the first sky map of antimatter. That's not at all uh, esoteric. It's actually much less esoteric than dark matter or dark energy. This is something we can see on the sky. You have here the sky map of antimatter electrons. Okay. We use that in integral right now, still flying, more than 20 years. Actually, we have 22 years now of lifetime. And if you have the image here to the lower right, already wondered what these roundish or elliptic spots are when you walk under the trees, well, then it's exactly that principle. You use little camera obscura, little stenope, uh, little holes in the trees, leaves in the canopy, and every hole, if it's small enough, produces a disk of the sun. So you can see imaging by just having holes is something which you even know. But source has to be quite strong so that you see it with your eyes. But this is the principle. Now, what has this to do with Fresnel? Well, this thing has been invented, this shadow casting imaging, long ago, in the 60s, by... Dyke and Abel, and at that, that time, you didn't have a computer to deconvolve this complicated shadow from different sources. Imagine how complicated it is if you superpose here not to the left one source, which you can understand, one source, one shadow, many sources, many shadows. It's complicated. To make it simple, you need a computer to correlate this shadow pattern with the, shad with the pattern of the mask. This in the 60s didn't exist. So this will be probably interest Alain Aspe, who did holography. Dyke and Abel, they used a Fresnel zone plate to put as the mask pattern. So every star in the sky will produce on the film, on your photographic film, a Fresnel zone pattern. If there is three stars, then there is three zone patterns on the bottom. Now, what you do now, you take this photograph and shrink it photographically so that it becomes, the spatial frequency becomes comparable to visible light. And then you take a coherent light source, which is just about to evolve at that time. But okay, you can use mercury vapor lamp and a spatial filter and a, a, a Fabry Perrault and produce a kind of a laser beam and with that laser beam, you can reconstruct this shadow gram, and then you get the source out. On the lower left is this play Orion, which is on the, on the upper left. On the right, you see the shadow gram. So you have the seven shadows of these seven Fresnel zone plates. And after illuminating with a coherent light source, like you do it with a hologram, you get back the source distribution. This is quite smart. 
just long before we were able to do that with computers. And so somehow this shadow casting business here is connected to Fresnel zone plates, and actually it is still sometimes used and discussed. Okay, but can we use Fresnel zone plates or Fresnel lenses rather in astronomy, in high energy astronomy? Yes, we do. If you have a, your Fresnel lens here to the left, you have refractive indices, which is for gloss somewhere around 1.5. So if you make a divergent lens, the type which is on the back of these trucks sometimes before they had uh, cameras to look to the back, you had a wide field of view looking back into this divergent lens. Now we use in X-ray and gamma rays, we can use a divergent lens to be converg convergent. Because uh, at hard X-rays and in gamma rays, the refractive index is strangely underneath of one. That could also be a, a reason for questioning here, <laughs> because you know that refractive index is the speed of the light in the medium over the speed of light. So some might think there is fishy. It's not. But <laughs> it's not. Well, not for Alain. But for people here, they might ask the question. Alain might answer. So we can make these Fresnel phase lenses quite big. They can provide the desperately needed sensitiv sensitivity improvements and could do incredible angle resolution, which we cannot do with this stupid shadow casting technique where our resolution right now is like four full moons on the sky. It's not very good. This Fresnel lens could do an incredible job. My friend Jerry Skinner has cal calculated that, and uh, you could do a five-meter diameter lens, look at these uh, antimatter electrons in the galactic center, and, uh, well, would have a huge effective area and an incredible resolution. The only little backside is it has an incredible focal length. So if you had this five-meter lens, you wouldn't probably see it because the detector spacecraft, if it's close to you, would be one million kilometers away from the lens. So that's another <laughs> quite paradox thing that when you use Fresnel lenses, you're proud that they have such a short focal length. So the diameter of your lighthouses can be quite restricted. <laughs> it's, this is a, it's an important parameter, I suppose, for you. Well, if you do it in hard X-rays, well, it's the opposite. You have incredible focal lengths, but you can focus, which, as a matter of fact, is a complicated thing to do. Now, I'm jumping even further than just energetic light. We now go to a phenomenon to finish this, which is called cosmic rays. Here you see the cosmic ray sp spectrum. It's mostly protons. Then there is also heavier nuclei in there, uh, helium particles, iron particles, even uh, higher uh, mass particles. So on the back side here, on the downside of the energy, you have probably um, on top of this curve, all to the left, about four protons per square centimeter in second. And now they get more and more energetic here. A mosquito here, the ones when they hit you yesterday, uh, had, would probably have an energy of 10 to the 12 EV. The biggest machine on Earth, the LHC at CERN, can do something at 10 to the 40 some EV. And when you use it in a collision with antiprotons, then you get up to 10 to the 17 EV. So look at how high we measure energies here. The highest are around 10 to the 21 EV, probably an iron nucleus. We don't know quite that well. But this is the energy of a tennis service, 200 kilometers an hour, 50 gram. It's just unbelievable. Who can do that? Well, we have a little idea here that this is cosmic accelerators like supermassive black holes, when they do shock acceleration, they can punch these protons and give them that high energy. So that's how we think these things accelerate. But of course, we would like to measure. We would like to measure more than a couple 
of uh, dozens which we have measured now. The problem here is that you get one event every square kilometer and century. So either you have really good patients and uh, wait for a long time, or you have lots of kilometer squares. And the best way to do is go to space, look through Fresnel lens, and look at the dark side of the Earth. Because these things make like kind of shooting stars when they come into the atmosphere, but the shooting star will develop at once, not with some tens of kilometers a second, but essentially the speed of light. And if you have a very fast camera and a very big field of view, then you see these things coming in to the atmosphere. So it's making astronomy by looking downward. Kind of strange again. But there is a Fresnel lens, and we have right now a prototype on the space station looking out on the window. Here is that Fresnel lens. And I'll finish my uh, speech here with uh, a little uh, proof of principle we did here a few years ago with the balloon prototype called the USO balloon. It's the prototype of that space observatory. It has a Fresnel lens. We launched it with the French space agency CNES from a balloon base in Canada. It uses two square meter Fresnel lenses and it looks also, once it's up on 40 kilometers, here uh, looking down to Earth, a smaller area. And of course you cannot hope, uh, because you have a few square kilometers here, you cannot hope that one of these things comes in. So we have rented a helicopter, equipped it with a laser, and shot a laser into the field of view. And now here you see the image moving, uh, which we did from above. The helicopter shoots this beam out. So this is about a 30 centimeter long drop of light, which zooms with light speed through the field of view. If you were uh, a physicist, you would say, is the speed of light really 300,000 kilometers a second? Yeah, we did it. It is. We see this light pulse under us. Whoops. Well, it was the next before last slide. Something happened here. Uh, anyway, I'll just give you a preview of what was on the very last slide. It is the Fresnel lens. Whoops. Yeah, you're back, but I'm obviously out of something. Not a problem. So the Fresnel lens was also serving as a porthole. So when we landed in Canada, there is a lot of lakes, and the payload fell into a lake. And thanks to the Fresnel lens, which uh, kept our instrument dry, the detector and all the electronics actually survived. So. Fresnel lenses not only save merchandise and lives on your oceans, but it also preserved here my instrument when falling into a lake in Canada. So, thanks. Merci beaucoup. Alors, thank you very much, and for the final presentation. It's for the final presentation, Mr. Palatier. So Jacques Manchard mentioned this this morning. We're heading off in all sorts of different directions, different uses, even the most unlikely. We have science, culture, and perhaps even gastronomy. So Mr. Palatier, who is an art historian, and president of the Knowledge of Contemporary Art Association, has a bakery art gallery. And he's going to try to show you all of this to see how he put all this together. I'm sure it'll be fascinating. It's chemistry, in fact. All right, so now the real work begins, because my mom always said to me, you can't go swimming uh, if you if, if you can swim right after lunch because your digestion hasn't started yet, but now the digestion has started. So thank you very much, and uh, to the two previous speakers because I learned a lot from you. I know it's not easy to speak after lunch as well. 
I'm going to start talking about questions that might strike us as being perhaps far away from us, but are really not, in fact. We're going to talk about contemporary art, and you know, and you have known for a very long time, that light is at the heart of the uh, concerns of artists. Uh, uh, and, um, an American uh, poet and uh, the big generation flagship said, what is art? What is color? What is vision? These are old questions and require new answers. Did you know that the Greeks, who only knew the role of the atmosphere very partially in terms of the importance of their lives, the vital element was not air, but light. And dying was not stopping breathing. It was if you couldn't see the light anymore. That was when you died. Now, to close this seminar, and I'm perhaps the more recreational aspect, uh, if you compare it to what has been said up to now in the last two days, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the use of light in art and you'll understand that this is a personal choice because there are dozens of thousands of works that of light art. So, of course, I had to make difficult choices, which doesn't claim to be exhaustive, with only five or six different works. And it's not an attempt to uh, lead you, that it says orienting contemporary art. I just want to talk to you a little bit about lenses, mirrors, and lights. And I want to put a capital L on light. Brian Jensen, wrote, I had a transcendental vision of colored light today on my way to Marseille. We were on a long avenue with trees, and I was closing my eyes in the sunset when I had drawings, lights, and colors of a supernatural nature exploding behind my eyelids, a multidimensional kaleidoscope through space. I was swept through space in an infinite world. That is what vision is. That is the dream machine that you look at with your eyes closed. The uh, light impulses, the light pulses stimulate the electric flow in the brain. So here you have a user who can see forms, complex colors, growing uh, light intensity, and you'll be submerged with color, with forms and symbols that flow around you, and you can have a very intense experience, uh, of course, with a psychedelic approach almost, and you can just stop that by opening your eyes. And this experience that I uh, described to you uh, led him to design the dream machine with a light bulb in the center with a rotating uh, cylinder uh, with uh, Ian Somerville, who was a mathematician who worked uh, with Brian Geisen. To begin with, two works to observe space and time. Yeah, unlike uh, sailors who are guided by uh, lighthouses, art has no destination. So perhaps an orientation is just learning to lose yourself it's just pushing the limits a little bit further, and that's exactly what Michelangelo Pistoletto did in 1966 here in this work that I appreciate, which is called The Infinite Cubic Meter. And now here you have not two mirrors, but six mirrors. And if you look at it at the top of the piece, you will be able to see the mirrors on the top if you enlarge the picture, and they form a cube with reflective surfaces inside. So the mirrors delimit a space, and it is these spaces that are reproduced infinitely. So you have the mirror effect in the cube that is not vis visible. You come into the work through a mental exercise with the imagination. Michelangelo Pistoletto wrote, inside the infinite is included in a finite body. This infinite body has the function of reproducing the infinite. The cubic meter is a unit that takes on life by uh, removing itself from the material aspects of the infinite. The cube is infinite minus one. There you have it. It is at the Pompidou Center. It dates back to 1966, and Michelangelo Pistoletto, who's a major figure of art in Italy, opens the doors of the imaginary and says that someone who has no destination cannot get lost. Next slide, please. 
also the earth. This is an Algerian artist called Faisal Bakrich, born in 1972. And it is St. Simon who said, men, humans with imagination will show us the way. And I believe that the globe is one of those demonstrations. History created utopias, but utopias also created history. And this is a luminous globe that accelerates and turns on itself, and its speed no longer allows us to see the natural lights of the continents. So you have an artist who thinks that today nations and nationalisms are a thing of the past. You know, with all the networks, the communication and transport means we have, it means that the world is now one. It is one Earth, and we will just keep it as a memory of one Earth. I see that some of you are smiling, perhaps with optimism. You know, artists are here to ask ourselves questions, not necessarily to provide answers. But you know this turning globe, this rotating globe, is perhaps the image of the world where the urgency that we associate with globalization uh, and we actually get lost like uh, Dervish Turner, uh, the Mevlevi in, in Turkey. Maybe the next image. And now the sky and the earth. I was listening to the conversation we were having over lunch about how we polish mirrors, and I think Anish Kapoor, who is an Indian artist born in 1954, a British sculptor of, a sculptor of Indian origin, and produced a series of works called Sky Mirror. And Joël Chevrier, in a part of his Art and Science Chronicle, show that it's a concave disc in, uh, it uh, has a mass of 10 tons for a diameter of 6 meters, a mirror, as you can imagine, was not easy to make. Uh, the mirrors, lenses, uh, you have clearly identified this over the days that have gone past, are two pillars of optics which allow us to see on different scales, from the infinitely large to the invisible around us, and the imagery at different scales is one of the major challenges of science, but also of art, and a concern that is shared by Anish Kapoor. And in Sky Mirror, you can see the mirror's position, so we can see the sky. And declares, I'm really interested in the way in which sculpture activates space. And that is what these mirrors are. That is how they work. It's like a painting. It's as if you had the sky on the ground. It's as if it was a, a, a hole in space, as if the object itself did not exist. It is a sort of passageway, an endless passageway through Sky mirror actually turns the world upside down. Of course, uh, it says that the mirror doesn't, didn't exist, as if this piece of sky was really with us and not above us. Anish Kapoor uh, puts the sky on the ground clearly to allow us to raise and look up and take and realize how large our world is. And the sun, what about the sun and man in the sky? This is an installation that has become legendary with over 2 million visitors in the space of six months. In 2003, Olaf or Eliasson uh, was at the Tate Modern in London, and it's called the Weather Project. Uh, it's a half sun reflected in the mirrors at, on 35 meters high, um, a single color with tungsten monofrequency lights, and a sort of mist that is spread throughout the space. It is clearly a site dedicated to art and a reconstitution of an element of <coughs> nature and also a reconstitution of feelings of sunrise, sunset, what it gives the viewer, the onlooker, and in the way that they are expressed by painters, in particular by English landscape artists. The Tate Hall became a huge playground, as it were, and some were looking at it in the same way they would do uh, in nature. They would lie down, look at the ceiling. And Eliasson created uh, the, the, to, to this work to uh, emphasize that our senses could play their full role. The uh, experience of art shows that everything is culture much more than nature. And in that sense, art is without a doubt a form of mediation. Art, if you remember in history, the ambition to maintain a critical vigilance with regard to beliefs, whether they were technicist, positivist, or religious, here we have a new romantic formula. We have something that would allow us to revisit the fantasies of modernity by articulating them in the current technological processes. 
and I love this picture where you see humanity almost like in the Renaissance projected into the sky. And here you can see that this is the moment for us of reappropriating the earth. Next picture, please. The relationship between time and space is really expressed in all the major installations created from the 1980s. And uh, James Turrell, one of the great artists of land art, American land art, James Turrell was born in 1943. Uh, it's one of these artists who finally will include the corpus and the body as part of a body in movement. A body will build the, 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 the movement as much as it is built by it. This is uh, at the entrance to the Guggenheim Museum, uh, and uh, it is the largest installation uh, created in a museum, created by James Turrell today. It's an aluminium structure, 25 meters high, um, and it completely occupies uh, the rotunda at the Guggenheim in New York. Below it, you can see two people who are sitting. Uh, on this, uh, and they are sitting to visit, and it's a perfect space for the visitor to be able to contemplate the work. And artists, and James Turrell in particular, design a piece, and it's an environment. It is a full, colorful, and luminous uh, piece, and you have to sit there to meditate on it. Technically, it's quite impressive. There are two rings of LED lights, uh, which are in installed uh, on shelves. It's over a thousand devices in total, and they're related by cables to a color combiner, which is controlled by programs by the Tarot uh, workshops, which are concentrating the light. Next. Ah, this is not the picture I'd actually planned on seeing now, but that's okay. That's okay. I'll talk about this one. No, okay. Well, I'll come back to this one. Let's go to the next one. Next one. Go again, again, stop. I thought I changed it, but I hadn't changed it on the memory stick. I changed it in my computer. Anyway, this would be a conclusion. I know I'm the last one, and I'd really like to show you some artists who really used the Fresnel lens in their work. And I added in three artists here in a series of works, five minutes of additional happiness before we close these days of discussion and exchange. You recognize the question mark, the luminous question mark, to finish with the question of light. Liberation, the cover of Liberation uh, for, uh, in, uh, in 2009 when Levi Strauss passed away. And it's a work by Alfredo Jarre, who's a, a Chilean, Chilean artist who's extremely brilliant. And the uh, title of the work is The Change, uh, the Radical Change of Viewpoint with Respect to Others. Because Levi Strauss invited anthropologists to keep a distant view to guarantee the legitimacy and the synonym for him of objectivity of their work. And in, on many occasions, Levi Strauss uh, advocated the equal importance of cultures and the diversity of cultures. For him, it wasn't so much a moral position as an intellectual position. He called it a differential gap, and this differential gap was a source of richness. A cultural uniformity could only create loss. And the idea of civilization, a global civilization, for him was an abstraction. And in 1971, he talked about a form of deafness between cultures. And he was greatly criticized for that. And I think that recent events, unfortunately, have proved him right. And as a conclusion, this leads to the luminous question mark. We are at a moment in our history when there are no perhaps faraway places to discover, but we have to discover uh, cultures. Civilization or universal civilization is linked to a perception of the effects of globalization. 200 years ago, the Fresnel lens facilitated exchange, and now there's a lot of work showing how much the capacity to travel, mobility, is a capital for us. It is a capital in the same way as income, which is economic capital, or social capital, such as our professional family or friend friendships, uh, our relationships. In the work on Bourdieu, on the social capital, he's, we talk about mobility capital, habitus, mobility. 
Mobility emphasizes strategic, oppress, uh, strategic expression, which emphasizes personal mobility. The fact that mobility is also a matter of choice, strategy, not only of social determinism and economic and technical determinism, that belongs to us. So it means that in this context, we realize that the field of art is not removed from other areas. It is a globalized phenomenon today, which is a complex network of relationships. There is no geographical distance between them anymore. So now artists are in a new space that they have to conquer. And the topography, whether it's local, national, transnational, geopolitical, but also uh, uh, landless, or it, it, it's actually totally moving, and we'll have to ensure that humanity does not turn off the light. And now perhaps uh, we could come back just to the previous pictures here for the three examples of artists who actually worked with the Friend of Life. Rosa Mekman, Kim Shi, uh, in Eindhoven, uh, Light Barrier. It is the second edition. It is concave mirrors. This work is a complex network of uh, mirrors and beams. It is a reflection on the spectacle, the show, and the illusion. And there is a complexity showing moving forms that are implemented. So the installation created like ghosts of light, graphic objects that float in space. Maybe if you look at the next space, you can see the installation, which is presented with an increased intensity. And this creates a color, a contrast with the projections of the white light. The light will then move with control and scale to make lighted objects. And this will create a semi-material approach. So you can actually touch it. It's a haptic approach almost. It's almost a tactile, haptic light in the sense of the dialogue between touching and sight, uh, developing the theories, the regal theories. Sorry, just three minutes with uh, Kim Chi, and sometimes you have to let the artists speak for themselves, and that's quite enlightening. Kim Chi and Chips. The Cycles Retina is a collaborative installation uh, with me and Kimchi and Chips. It's a big installation. When you see it on the footage, sometimes it's hard to understand the scale, but it's like easily three meters high. It's wide. It has eight projectors that all go into this two walls of mirrors that are kind of like at a, an angle of each other, and they then reflect the light that is projected into the mirrors in a focal point, and that focal point kind of holds this kind of uh, making material of the light as a, a focus projection that is also a story. So at Kimchi and Chips, we're often creating new image systems, as in something which allows an image to exist in the world, something which takes imagination and puts it into physical space, so creates these different portals between the imaginary world and the physical world, as in makes images. And then with Light Barrier, we found this technique which would make images appear like midair, and you could you know, stick your hand through them or walk around them. So we could create something graphic that was physical at the same time, and therefore it would ride this boundary between like being imaginary and being real, but also like being light and being matter, because it almost feels like math. And therefore, it's why we talk about the light barrier, because light barrier is this delineation between something being physical and something being uh, immaterial. We invited Rosa to lead a story and to work with her in terms of designing the aesthetic, to um, get out of our own set. But also, there's a lot of kimchi and chips in there in terms of how it looks and how it feels, but to try to articulate somebody else's imagination. For me, what Cyclops Retina does, it's, it does something that I had never seen before, right? It, it actually materializes light. It kind of requires you to step towards the image and to see what is happening here, to kind of be um, constructed and to understand this is an interplay between a story and a technology, and then to see how it illustrates a way of thinking, that, which is what 
the narrative does. We're showing you something which is unlike anything else which you would have seen before because we're making an image in a very different way. And therefore, it'll take time for your eyes to figure out how to see through this thing because it's, it's like a, it's a new ability that you have to, you have to get. You have to, you have to train yourself. There you have it. So that's a concrete example. And I think we're going to see two other examples. Vincent Leroy, I could not not have a French artist, of course. He was born in 1968. He studied industrial design at the Industrial Design School in Paris. And he gave design a dimension at the crossroads between art and architecture with kaleidoscopic uh, sculptures which look at the prisms of reality. Here you have a Joshua Tree uh, work in, here you can see these are Fresnel lenses that are used directly uh, to create these large mobile uh, appearances in Paris in 2020 at the Trocadero in Paris. Uh, this is shown, Vincent Leroy, it was seen uh, throughout the world. These are large kaleidoscopes and these were huge huge lenses uh, and you could see the the undulation the reflection the vibration the rotation that brings us to a new dimension where we go between oscillation and the hybrid nature between the real image and the extremely immersive quality of his work and finally we will finish with with something that looks more like a lighthouse <laughs> with uh, the word of Lafour Eliasson. I could have talked about Olafur Eliasson uh, because his work is so dense and he worked a lot with, you know, laboratories to produce work today. Olafur Eliasson in 1999 in, uh, did this work, Five Orientation Lights. So these five orientation lights, and this is where I took my title. It is the last work to conclude on the... Uh, his work, which was shown in the Baroque Baroque uh, exhibition in Vienna. And you can see that it's shown in the upper Belvedere. It's a proc, they're near each other, you can see. And the light fields actually overlap each other and combine. And if you look at the next picture, they were actually shown for the first time in San Gimignano, uh, where uh, the you could see see it in San Gimignano in the Tuscan landscape in Italy. And uh, you can see this using ordinary mapping techniques to see the landscape. Uh, so I wanted to show you these. I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a great end to the conference. Thank you very much to all three of you for those extremely diverse and enlightening presentations. I think, I'm looking at Jacques Morchard, I think that we are behind schedule. Uh, I don't know if we have any time for questions, and that's what I'm asking here. Well, there's no boat going anywhere, so, so I can't hear what Jacques is saying, sorry, because he doesn't have the microphone, but I'm, I think he might be saying we still have time for questions. Sorry, I can't hear. Ah, uh, yes, microphones. And... I wanted to ask a question about the Fresnel uh, lenses for X-rays. Why are the focals so long? Is it because uh, N1 minus one module is small? What is the reason for that, please? Yes, the the uh, refraction index is close to one. It's very close to one, and we could have a smaller gaps and that would increase the diffraction angle but um, but there is a limit on the 
smallest on the on the groove that cannot be smaller than uh, a number of microns. And uh, when you look at what is possible uh, today in the state of the art, uh, it, di it creates a dimension for the lens. And if we do that with real materials, uh, well, for gamma, it becomes really long. If I understood in, in, in microscopes, we use uh, Fresnel lenses for x-rays, which have uh, smaller focals, which are micro-lithographed, and for uh, x, and that will uh, focus on much shorter focals. But it's very, very small. It's not even uh, a square millimeter. It's tiny uh, micro, uh, uh, micro lithography. And so uh, it will be a little bit like the 70,000 kilometers. I think that's what we heard this morning in the presentation talking about, well, while we're at it, well, we can take it a little bit further. But right now, as you may have understood, it's a concept. Good morning. I would like to talk to the artist, to the art historian. For me, the best example of transmission of light is in the cathedrals when the sun comes through uh, the, the, the stained glass windows. You can see without any equipment, you can see through the rose window the, the light traveling. Uh, what do you think of that? I think there is nothing uh, more beautiful than the green beam and all the other effects that the cathedral masters created by working with a great deal of, of interest in astronomy. And we see uh, the, the heights they managed to reach in knowledge and for their time. It was absolutely amazing. And I think that today there are many artists who had scientific backgrounds before they started being artists and to understood that art is not just here to enlighten. We can use it uh, symbolically, but of course we can also use it to extract scientifically and to take data from art and use it to show that the area of art and the area of science, well, they're, they're quite close to each other. I agree with you. Thank you. I have perhaps a question on the European lighthouse route. Uh, Mr. Kohler, you explained to us about the European route of lighthouse. You explained to us all the processes to go through the hook before you managed to... Uh, do, you, do you know how long it's going to take before you will be able to create uh, the European route of lighthouse? Do you have any idea of the time scale before you can do that? I think uh, that the European route of lighthouses is already existing. But we are not as an um, um, cultural route uh, of Europe, or, uh, and uh, therefore this process, I think it will take at least three years from my point of view. You have seen all the requirements which we have to fulfill, and we started now six weeks ago. Uh, the uh, starting procedures, uh, they take time, and uh, we have also to set up our own website, which shows all the different countries and uh, the lighthouses from these different countries. There's still a lot of work to do at the beginning, and uh, all the other uh, subjects which we have to fulfill. And uh, therefore, from my point of view, when we are good and uh, uh, we are working together as we do it now, then we will take three years approximately. But I cannot really prove it. This could be faster or longer. Une question, deuxième rang. A uh, question again, uh, Patrick. Yes, thank you for your very interesting presentations. 
the presentation on uh, the European route of lighthouses inspired something in me. And I think it's it would be quite interesting to use a, a project. Uh, we, there was a, a project to restore the Trocadero lighthouse. Uh, which was destroyed uh, on the Trocadero, and to use that project, one of the obstacles to uh, reinstalling that light, uh, and there was a lot of effort uh, made to try and have that light reinstalled at the Trocadero Lighthouse in Paris, <laughs> and this was a project in Paris. Uh, yes. So I think, uh, in fact, the most serious aspect is there was no usefulness seen in, in, in uh, recreating this Trocadero lighthouse. And uh, what I suggested is that we use it as an exhibition for all the lighthouses in the world. And this is where it all started, really, in the 16th arrondissement in Paris. And that is where the uh, lighthouse department was uh, created as from 1867. And that is where the whole industrialization of lighthouses started. And I thought it would be a really good idea uh, I think it would be a really good idea, looking at lighthouses and beacons, to be able to uh, you know, show the value of that light, which is currently almost rotting in a building in Paris, in the Paris area, in roissy beaubourg And perhaps that Phare de France could help us to support this project that started with the Historical and Archaeological Society of the 16th arrondissement of Paris. And um, we would like to really materialize the history of lighthouses in the 16th arrondissement in Paris. So imagine that we could uh, really use, for example, lasers or holograms to show that and to really give information to the many tourists who come there to Paris and use that as part of the lighthouse route. And it's a dream. As Solange Major said, well, you have to be a bit crazy sometimes. And then sometimes when you're crazy enough, you can actually do it. <laughs> it's just a proposal for this lighthouse in Paris. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think DG Ampa of Maritime Affairs could perhaps support this to make this part of the route of lighthouses. And uh, perhaps we can also try and get uh, political representatives to try and, and make this move forward. Thank you. Just to follow on from that, you know, as as my grandmother said, if you have a good idea, then make that idea come true. You know, I think the idea of Fort de France is to bring together managers, but if among those managers in a state department someone is interested in, in that um, light, of course it could be a project that could be taken up by Fort de France. For now, it's not yet on the agenda, but uh, I think uh, the light is still kept, though, and stored in appropriate conditions. Presentations, and uh, as well as the uh, European light uh, route of lighthouse, Ayala correct every word heritage of lighthouse. So we choose uh, one of uh, them as lighthouse of the year. Until now, we chose just the five lighthouses, and the nomina nominated uh, lighthouse is about 63. So we are, I think, we can make. The older list were the lighthouse in the future, as well as European lighthouse. Thank you. Très bien, bien. Je crois qu'on peut. Very good. Well, I think we can give a round of applause here to our three speakers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>